uh, Vienna, city of waltzes, schnitzels, and reanimated debt collectors. Yep, that's the future we're looking at, folks. Turns out those Viennese pastries weren't as filling as they seemed, because 82% of the city is living on ramen noodles, while the one percenters are swimming in a Scrooge McDuck vault. Enter Vincent Bauman, smoother than Mozart on a bender. This charming fellow is a death insurance salesman, which basically means he convinces rich people to avoid being turned into a human Swiss army knife after they kick the bucket. We're talking spare parts, brain storage, because apparently cloud storage is for suckers, and even for the ladies. A one-way trip to becoming a never-ending birthing machine. Gruesome? A bit. But hey, gotta pay off those student loans somehow, right? Meanwhile, down in the not-so-fancy part of town, a family is desperately trying to avoid the whole zombie labor situation. They cram their dearly departed grandma into a vacuum-sealed bag, like a particularly morbid Vienna sausage, hoping to ship her off somewhere less necromantic. Spoiler alert, it doesn't work. The authorities sniff out grandma faster than you can say debt collector. And before you know it, she's hooked up to the reanimation machine, ready for a life, well, not really a life, of servitude. Back at the land of luxury life insurance, Vincent is practicing his spiel. He's got a video prepared to scare the rich pants off his potential client. On one side, a horrific scene of a woman being chopped and diced for parts. On the other, a peaceful, tearful funeral with, presumably, an open bar. Easy choice, right? Meanwhile, in the resistance movement, Lisa, our blonde-wigged warrior princess, is plotting a daring raid. Her target? The giant warehouse where all the reanimated debt slaves are chilling. Or, rather not chilling because that wouldn't be very productive. The goal, shut down the whole operation and free the undead pews. Unfortunately, Lisa's crew is about as well-equipped as a bake sale with dreams of world domination. They also have a problem with some recently arrested comrades who might just spill the beans about their little rebellion if they don't get sprung from jail. Looks like Lisa's gonna need a miracle bigger than a life-size chocolate satcher tort to pull this one off. So, Lisa, our discount Joan of Arc with a bad case of borrowed blonde, has a secret weapon. Connections. Shocking, right? Turns out even revolutionaries need a good network, because carrier pigeons are so last century. She sweet talks her way into a level 2 ID card in a single day from a guy named Philip. Philip sells secret information to make money, besides his job as an insurance salesman. Lisa asks for a level 3 card because they need access to secret offices for the mission. At first, Philip is unsure but eventually agrees to get the card within two days. Meanwhile, Vincent, the smoothest salesman this side of the Danube, is working his magic. He's basically a human Wikipedia page for his clients, memorizing their deepest fears and favorite polka tunes. This time, his target is a sweet old lady. Picture this, Vincent waltzing around the room with her like a malfunctioning music box, all while listing the horrifying consequences of skipping death insurance. It's enough to make you long for the sweet embrace of oblivion. Needless to say, Granny coughs up the dough faster than you can say, strudel. But back at the office, Vincent's victory dance gets a major record scratch. Turns out, his waltzing Granny was actually his colleague Dietrich's client. Apparently, Dietrich couldn't sell ice to penguins, so Vincent swooped in and stole his commission. Now, Dietrich's stuck with the ultimate hard case. Lisa's rich dad, Vladimir Sokolo. Can you imagine trying to sell life insurance to a guy who could buy the entire Vienna woods with pocket change? Talk about a tough sell. Lisa, meanwhile, is busy brainstorming with her rebel squad. Their target? Not the Winter Palace, but the Geriatric Ward, a fancy term for a warehouse full of reanimated debt slaves. The plan? Bust the place wide open and send those undead peons on a permanent vacation, six feet under. No more endless toiling for these guys. Speaking of vacations, Vincent's about to get one himself, a one-way ticket to Demotion City. His boss, Diana Dorn, who probably sleeps on a bed made of money, dangles a promotion in front of him, but with a catch. Sell death insurance to Vladimir, or kiss your fancy office goodbye. Back at work, Vincent finds another surprise. Dietrich has vanished, replaced by none other than our good old ID-dealing friend, Philip. Guess Dietrich couldn't handle the pressure of selling insurance in a city where everyone's already broke. Lisa, meanwhile, is having her own drama. Philip, the supposed information broker, ditches their meeting at the club, leaving her high and dry, and idealist. She races to his apartment, only to find it occupied by Dietrich's wife, sporting a suspiciously smug grin. 
Looks like Philip took a page from Vincent's book and stole a commission. This time, selling Lisa and her crew out to the insurance company. Except, Lisa hasn't exactly spilled the beans about their grand attack plan. In fact, she's kind of relieved. Just when you think things can't get any crazier, Lisa watches Dietrich leave his home and follows him to the market. He goes to the insurance company and changes his life insurance to cover his soon-to-be-born baby. Then, he walks to a bridge and does the unthinkable. Turns out, the demotion hit him harder than a schnitzel coma, and he decides to take a permanent dirt nap. Talk about a dramatic exit. So, Lisa and Vincent bump into each other on the street, and let's just say the conversation is about as smooth as a cheese grater on your face. Vincent, ever the charmer, decides to blackmail Lisa's ridiculously rich dad, Vladimir, using some juicy insurance info. Turns out, Vladimir switched his policy to Lisa, who, by the way, hates the whole death insurance racket. But Vladimir, bless his stubborn heart, wouldn't budge on getting a new policy. This little stunt costs Vincent his cushy job, and BAM! He's demoted to insurance peon in the satellite slums, a place that would make a cockroach reconsider its life choices. Speaking of cockroaches, Vincent's new apartment is about the size of a shoebox and dustier than a forgotten pancake recipe. Desperate to get back in Lisa's good graces and score a promotion, of course, he tracks her down at a pub where she moonlights as a singer, because apparently fighting a dystopian debt system doesn't pay the bills. Just as things are getting interesting, Lisa's friend Chris, who looked like he took a tumble down a flight of stairs, multiple times, stumbles back into their lives. He's in rough shape and needs medical attention. Stat. Meanwhile, Vincent's boss, Diana Dorn, who probably has a Scrooge McDuck vault filled with shillings, hatches a new plan. She figures Lisa's the key to getting Vladimir to buy insurance, so she tasks Vincent with becoming Lisa's BFF. Not exactly the career move he envisioned, but hey, beggars can't be choosers, right? Lisa, ever the resourceful rebel, decides to play Vincent at his own game. She rents a room with a perfect view of his apartment window, because subtlety is for chumps, and starts spying on him. Then, in a move that would make Neil deGrasse Tyson raise an eyebrow, she calls Vincent, and proposes a date. Vincent, suspicious, but ever the opportunist, agrees. He uses his newfound knowledge, thanks to his stellar spying skills, to drop a bombshell on Lisa. Her dear old dad switched his insurance to her. The plot thickens faster than a grandma's gravy. Chris, on the brink of death, begs Lisa not to let the evil insurance company turn him into a zombie laborer. Thinking fast, Lisa transfers her insurance to Chris, basically giving him a cheat code out of the afterlife workforce. Chris kicks the bucket shortly after, but hey, at least the insurance company can't get their grubby mitts on him. Back at work, Vincent gets another delightful surprise. Vladimir, Lisa's dad, has been accidentally injured. Vincent, with the detective skills of a particularly slow goldfish, knows the company is behind it, but can't prove a thing. He rushes to Lisa, who's about as happy as a pretzel dipped in vinegar upon hearing the news. She doesn't believe Vincent's claims of innocence for a second, and to top it all off, she can't even see her dad because, shocker, without insurance, his body belongs to the company. Determined to free her father from his undead fate, Lisa dedicates herself to the cause. And guess who shows up at her apartment that night, looking for a little comfort, and maybe some intel. Yep, Vincent. One thing leads to another, and let's just say their hatred takes a very unexpected turn. They end up tangled in the sheets. Okay folks, hold on to your hats, because things are about to get darker than a Viennese cafe after closing time. Lisa, ever the resourceful rebel, uses Vincent like a used napkin sleeps with him, steals his fancy ID card, third level, no less, and then skips town with her dad in tow. Vincent, bless his clueless heart, even put a tracker on Lisa's bike, basically painting a neon target on her poor father's reanimated backside. The company swoops in faster than a hungry vulture at a buffet, snatching Lisa's dad back to the geriatric ward. Talk about a bad hair day for Lisa. The next day, Vincent shows up at the pub, looking like a kicked puppy. He claims the company used him, Shocking, right? And that he's on Lisa's side now. Lisa, with the emotional range of a wet sock, can't decide whether to hug him or hurl a pretzel at his head. Vincent, ever the charmer, convinces her to take him to the geriatric ward, because apparently zombie labor camp sounds too harsh. There they witness a horrifying scene. Bodies, including poor Dietrichs, being carted off to who knows where. Turns out the company doesn't discriminate, 
Lisa needs a new level 3 ID card to get her dad back. Vincent, ever the helpful ex-boyfriend, offers his own card, on one condition. Someone else goes in to get her dad, so that Lisa doesn't get hurt. Lisa, ever the strategist, hatches a plan that would make MacGyver blush. She takes Vincent to her childhood stomping ground, an abandoned water park. Nostalgia ensues, complete with awkward flirting and some questionable fashion choices. Long story short, they end up tangled in the sheets, because apparently, even the apocalypse can't stop romance, or bad decisions. The next day, Lisa channels her inner Miss Universe, and disguises herself as an insurance company lackey. The plan? Infiltrate the ward, unleash some high-tech electromagnetic shenanigans, and free the undead masses, or at least her dad. Vincent, ever the reliable goofball, follows her in, because why not? Everything goes according to plan, because when do these things ever go smoothly? Until, plot twist alert. Philip, the shady ID dealing dude, shows up and throws a wrench in the whole operation. Turns out, he was a double agent all along, working for the insurance company. Lisa gets captured, Frey gets captured, and Vincent is left feeling more lost than a tourist with a broken map. Just as Philip is about to shoot Vincent, because apparently everyone wants to take a pot shot at our hapless hero. Lisa gets shot first. Vincent, fueled by a cocktail of shock and maybe a smidge of misplaced affection, lunges at Philip. Sadly, Lisa doesn't make it, leaving Vincent emotionally adrift, and probably a little sticky from the whole getting shot situation. Diana, the ever opportunistic boss lady, swoops in and offers Vincent a deal. He, accidentally, Helped them stop the rebellion, so he gets his promotion back and a one-way ticket out of loser town. But Vincent, ever the rebel, well, sort of, has other plans. He sneaks back into the ward, finds Lisa hooked up to some creepy baby-making machine, because apparently, even in death, there's no escape, and whisks her away. Diana sees him but lets him go, because even evil overlords have a soft spot for a guy who just lost the love of his life, or her afterlife. Vincent takes Lisa to the abandoned water park, the scene of their, ahem, romantic encounter, and gives her a watery goodbye down a rusty old water slide.